Amen. Um, normally, I I guess you could say this message is like a word of encouragement, but it's probably going to step on some toes. kind of stepped on mine, so I know it's going to step on some toes. But It's called casting your votes. <laughs> How many of y'all been following the presidential polls? A few of you? Not enough. Everybody should be. It's pretty important. How many of y'all been watching the electoral map? It's pretty... <laughs> yeah, the one I showed to her. Huh? Anyway, the projections are... They're going to change, amen? amen? How many of you have been watching those advertisements, both sides, mudslinging each other? and blowing? How many of y'all believe those advertisements? No, you better not put that. <laughs> you know, there's... There's a, there's been a vast confusion and abundance of mudslinging in these advertisements, and actually, um, our extreme left media has been promoting just one party and just one man for four years. It's been a huge media circus. Uh, but how many of y'all watched the ninety minute debate last Wednesday? I see a few people smiling. You know, um, oh, amen. We uh, we left Bible study 10 minutes early. We, I told the folks I was going to pray. I don't know how many of y'all prayed in agreement with me during that time. But each time a question was asked, I prayed that the person was fixing to answer that question would be seen for who they really are. I didn't pray for one of them to really mess up, one of them to do really good. But God let them see who they really are. And one really messed up, one did really good. I asked at that time for a conviction of the Holy Spirit on those that claim to be true blood-bought Christians and helped last time to put a man in office that kills babies, that helped put a man in office that promotes same-sex marriage, to help put a man in office that supports further restrictions on us bearing our arms. For them to eyes to be open and to see the man for what he is. And for them to be convicted of the people that they are. Because if you can truly believe that you are a blood bought saint of God, how can you put a man in office that supports the worst of all abortions, live birth abortion? I make people mad when I talk about that. And now I can really make them mad because I'm doing it from here. And it's legal. For now. For now. There's 1,500 pastors in the United States, or 1,501, I'm not sure, that said today they would do what I'm doing. Now, it should be 150,000 pastors. I'm only one of those 1,501 pastors that promised that he would get up here and talk about candidates and dare IRS to come after because it's legal still. That tells you what kind of backbone pastors have nowadays. I'm allowed to talk about candidates and I'm allowed to say how they, how they support as long as I tell you the truth. I cannot endorse that candidate under Highway to Heaven Biker Church or Van Horn Ministry, but I can tell you in a heartbeat who I'm voting for. It's totally legal. Mr. Obama opposes voluntary prayer in school. That's not of God. He supports all abortion to include live birth abortion, and that's not of God. This last one, he supports forcing the Christian military chaplains to have to perform same-sex marriages. That's not of God. So how did it happen? We put him in office. We, the people, put him in office. As I think about our current situation in this country and how it's turned, and I look at my little five-year-old, mm, I wonder and I pray that we get it turned around quick. I also realized that, and it occurred to me, that everyone who's voting really believes that their candidate is the best. Now, I'll tell you what, you talk to a dogmatic person, it's an Obama Knights, what I call them, but you talk to them, that's a done deal. 
I mean, 27% after the election still thought he won the debate. I mean, the debate. And I was like, they're just, they're dead set, you know. So, but it reminded me of, um, of a story also. But when the person's made their mind up, what are we really doing trying to change that person's mind? There was a candidate for city council, and he was doing door-to-door campaign. He was knocking on the doors really out there trying to get everybody's attention and things were going great and he thought to himself that i got this i'm getting people's attention and he knocked on this grouchy old man's door and he give his little spill and the old man said vote for you well i'd rather vote for the devil <laughs> at this point the the candidate realized that he didn't have a chance swaying the old man and he smiled and he says i understand but since your friend's not running for office, can I count for you for my support anyway? <laughs> you know, when we, when we cast our votes in city, when we cast our votes in a state, when we cast our votes in a national election that we're fixing to do, we do so under the belief that we have the power through our vote to change things. We're taught that. And in America, we've, often reminded, we've been often reminded that our votes count because just one or two votes have made a difference before in the past. And our votes do make a difference. And we who are Christians should honor this sacred privilege, and we should go vote, and we've been putting these out, and it's probably not too late, but I think just about every Tuesday's the last day. Yes. You got your card? It'll show you on there. It'll show you on there. Mm Mm-hmm. It'll be in the paper and tell you based on the number that's on your card, brother. That's what I'm talking about. People are going to change. When's the last time you voted, Keith? Lucky there. I already feel better about doing this. I already feel better. Amen. And uh, we should honor this sacred privilege, and people are finally doing it. Um, our votes do make a difference. But with that said... We need to realize that there's two inherent weaknesses to the democratic process. There's, very, there's two problems. The first problem is we're voting for mortals. We're voting for sinners. They're no different than you or me. I don't care how moral and how upstanding the person is, okay? Whoever we vote into office is still a sinner. And if you've put your faith into him, he's going to let you down. He or she is going to let you down. He or she is still prone to the same weaknesses and sinful tendencies that you and I have. They are the same. They're not God. The second problem is when we Christians vote, there are times that when we cast our vote, we often do so under the mistaken belief that the candidate or that political party that we vote for has the power from within to change things. The last one was hope change, you know. Um, That's not true. That's not true, and it never has been. Some of the best politicians have recognized this. Benjamin Franklin once addressed an assembly struggling with a decision with these words, quote, In this situation of this assembly, groping as it were in the dark to find political truth and scarcely able to distinguish it when it is presented to us. How has it happened that we have not hitherto once thought of humbly applying to the Father of lights to illuminate our understanding. Mm. Another great politician, Abraham Lincoln, said, quote, It is the duty of nations as well as men to own their own independence upon the overruling power of God and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proved by all history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. The last one, 1984, Ronald Reagan declared, Without God, there is a coarsening of the society. Without God, democracy will not and cannot long endure. If we ever forget, if we ever forget that we are one nation under God, we will be one nation gone under. If we ever forget, you look around. If we ever forget, 
Why would we forget? Our money, our Pledge of Allegiance, many of the sayings on the public buildings in Washington, D.C. proclaim this desire to be one nation under God. So how could we forget? Well, actually, even with that overwhelming set of witnesses that we shouldn't forget, everybody's carrying a dollar on them, even we who are Christians can literally forget God's power over our nation. We can if we put faith in our own politicians more faith in our politicians than we have in God. The Old Testament has an interesting story about Israel's experience, and you all know it. They, uh, the nation was uneasy. They had a reason to be. They had enemies threatening them all around. The prophet of God, who was Samuel at that time, was growing old. Samuel's children weren't of God. Samuel's children were bad. And the people of the nation took it upon themselves to appoint a king so that they could have a king. What they didn't do was consult God because God wouldn't have appointed a king. Having a king symbolizes things like the desire to have your strength, you know, and, and you can ha all the other countries around have a king, so we got to have a king, and they did it. But what happened really is that they were uncomfortable with the fact that God hadn't answered, answered their prayers yet because they weren't praying. So God wasn't taking care of their problems for them. They wanted what they wanted now. God later told Samuel in 1 Samuel 8, 7, Listen to all the people. Listen to all that the people are saying to you. He's saying this to Samuel. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. You see. They put their faith in a politician, per se. So, a candidate. Now, don't get me wrong before you go to extremes. I didn't, I, I didn't say we ain't supposed to. I said we are supposed to vote. There was just a problem there. God was taken out of the picture and Saul was put up. You see the difference? Having Saul there and still consulting God to make sure it's the right person would have been good. I believe Christians ought to be involved in the political process, and I don't think they should just vote. I think we need God-fearing, able men in every office. It's a dangerous mistake to put more faith in politics or political parties than we do God. And it's easy to fall in the trap. I have. Like I said, I, this, I'm preaching to myself. Boy, I got spanked. How do we know that we've started relying more on God than our political parties? Or our politicians. How do we know we're really relying on God? Well, Second Timothy 2 8. I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer without anger or disputing. Without anger or disputing. Have you ever known someone who gets so involved in politics that they get into arguments all the time about it? Raise your hands, you know what I mean? <laughs> That's one. Are you one of them? I leave my hand up. I'm dogmatic. I was like, man, I gotta put that in the message. Go on, God. Come on, Daddy. I don't want to put that part in there. My stepdad had a policy at home. No, you don't talk religion. You don't talk politics at this house. Starts arguments. If we find ourselves getting riled up, arguing, argumentative. I talk with my brother here, and I can't even talk five minutes before we're both spun up. Cause we <laughs> but God's talking to both of us, ain't he, Jason? Yes, there is a story told about... <laughs> There's a story told of a man who had lived in a small town. He was a staunch Republican. He'd reached to be 90 years old. His doctor told him, George, I'm sorry to tell you this, but from the state of your health, you're not going to make it to the end of the year. You're going to die. The next morning, George woke up, and he got his son. He says, you need to take me down to the courthouse and let me change from Republican to Democrat right away. And his son said, Dad, you started the Republican Party in this town as it grew. You're a staunch Republican. You've been Republican all your life. You still don't miss a, 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 any type of get-together. What are you talking about? He says, well, I'm going to die, and if it's going to be somebody, it might as well be one of them. <laughs> That's a staunch Republican. <laughs> if a Christian... If a Christian ever finds themselves engaged in a discussion about politics or finds themselves getting angry 
are getting caught up in a heated debate where their temper's getting out of hand, it's a pretty good sign that we've taken our eyes off of God. In these circumstances, it's easy. I'm, I'm talking to myself and have them on a politician or have your faith in the next guy you want in office more than spending time with God. We've got to spend time with God. Paul tells us a method that we can use to correct this kind of political short-sightedness. In 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2, the Word of God says, I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone. Here's the hard part. For kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. That means everybody, folks. That means we're supposed to pray for all the politicians. We're supposed to pray for the ones we don't like, especially the ones we don't like. How many of you have honestly been praying for four years for Obama? Just a couple of hands. Yeah, yeah. did he get out of there? <laughs> this is the word of God for all politicians. Our Gerald Fleury wrote this. Prayer is political action. Prayer is social energy. Prayer in, is public good. Prayer shapes more of our nation's life than is formed by legislation. Whew, that's powerful. Let me say that one again. Prayer shapes more of our nation's life than is formed by legislation. That we have not collapsed into anarchy is due more to prayer than to the police. Prayer is sustained and intricate act of patriotism is the largest sense of that word. Far more precise, loving, and preserving than any patriotism served up in slogans. The, most, the, single, the single most important action contributing to whatever health and strength there is in our land is prayer. You see, our deciding vote is not the vote we're going to do on November 6th. It's not. It's the vote that we make in the privacy of our prayer closets up until then, on that day, and after that day. Our prayers for this country. You know, Proverbs 21.1 says this, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. Now, the Lord has to answer prayers. If we'd been praying for a revival, for Obama to get saved, for Obama to be more godlike, maybe in the last four years we would have had a revival in the White House and things would have changed. Maybe. Amen? I know a lot of people didn't pray that prayer with me. I've been praying for a revival for four years. And some of y'all have heard me pray that from up here. Let us have a revival in the White House starting at the top. In other words, God has the power to direct the direction of our leaders. Amen. And when we pray, the power of God is unleashed. Why should we pray for the success of whoever is in leadership? Imagine, well, I, got, I got a scripture. Yeah, amen. When Israel was held captive in a pagan nation, God told him this. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you will too prosper. Unquote. That's from the Word of God, and what it's saying is, is that if you're in a bad situation, if you pray for the top and they prosper, you're going to prosper. But if you pray for bad things and you don't want good things or whatever else, if they're in famine, we'll be in famine. Amen? Now, here's a prayer we've been praying. I think it's the last scripture for the day. We were praying it, those of you that went to the courthouse with us during the drought, this was a prayer that we prayed, and we've been praying this also for our country due to the leadership that we have. Second Chronicles 7.14, if you haven't taken any notes, that's a good one to go to today and look at again. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. It's time. 
Amen. It's time for Second Chronicles 7.14 that we turn from our wicked ways. We pray for those that are in the wicked ways. We stand in for our country and we pray for a huge change for God's work to be done in this country again. Turn it back over to God. I didn't have the time, but I was going to hook up this morning and a lot of, a lot of challenges, so it just must have not been meant to happen. But I was going to put the little DNC vote to put God back in their platform you got to see that if you haven't seen it. Whew. We need God back in both platforms. Whew. Do you believe in the power of prayer, yes or no? Yes. Do you believe in the power of prayer and fasting? Yes. Then I'm asking you today to prayerfully consider between now and 16 October to join the church, me and my family, and the church family, in a Daniel's fast for 21 days starting on 17 October. Okay? The power of prayer is unbelievable. And fasting and prayer is unbelievable. Anybody and everybody that's left in here that did it two years ago, because that was a long time ago, but they all have testimonies of what God did during those 21 days. And on the 22nd day, we stood here and people were going out. (laughs) Remember that? God is awesome. So 17 October through 6 November. On 6 November, we're going to be praying fervently, I'm sure, and a lot of us will be staying up late. I'll probably be texting back and forth to you, brother. Amen. Hit! That state turned red. Hoo-hoo! Glory to God. Okay. All right. But as blood-bought saints of God, we've got to come together, and we've got to pray together. We've got to fast together. Amen. God listens to people praying. I'm going to close with a living truth that happened to me for about four or five months in Desert Storm. I had a... Uh, A BYOB at my tent, seven days a week. We prayed. We had Bible studies that lasted, didn't matter. Nobody had to go anywhere. It was in the tent. We were right there. The biggest threat that they really worried about was chemical. And uh, we prayed. Then when... It really started happening for 39 days, I believe it was. 39 bombs being dropped, shaking the ground that we're at. I thought, wow, this is awesome. Demonstration of power. The wind was blowing from the north. Had been the whole time we were there. It was predominantly a northern wind. So we just, intelligence already told us that the chemicals are going to, it's going to happen. Those of you that are military or prior service, you already know. You get all these little things, tidbits of information when the captains and the colonels get together. And it's going to happen. So we're making sure we're ready for Mop 4. The biggest thing was at least have the mask on because of the kind of stuff they had was old stuff. The day before we went over, February 24, 91, the chaplain got on the air. And a whole regiment in their one last prayer and what built up to this was all those other prayers. And the chaplain started praying. And I was in my 113, and the driver, my two gunners behind me. And this white, milky substance started coming towards us. And it was hovering above the ground, just a few inches. And when it got just probably from about me to the door back there, it stopped. It didn't come towards us anymore, and the wind stopped. And the chaplain's still praying. And this white substance got a little darker, a little more dense, looked like a like a gas. And then it started going like this, back and forth. I had my hand on my mask, but I was just in shock. Just at the end of the prayer, I thought I was going nuts. <laughs> and it was just like, <laughs> and the wind started blowing from the south. I was scared to death. I didn't know what to say. And then my driver broke the ice, Sergeant Van Horn. Did you see what I just saw? And I said, are we talking about something that was white? <laughs> And he said, yes, sir. I said, yeah, that was the Holy Spirit going before us. I believe in the power of prayer. I've laid hands on tanks, and tanks have started charging. So 
Again, in closing, I just ask that each one of you prayerfully consider joining us in fasting and prayer for this country. On the 7th, those of you that participate in the Daniel's Fast, we won't have a Bible study. We're going to have a feast. Regardless of what happens on the 6th, we're going to have a feast here, and we're going to celebrate, or we're going to pray, or we're going to do both, but we're going to start praying for our country from this point on as a family. Amen. Let's pray.